Our last speaker is Steve Jones. He's an emeritus professor of genetics at University College London, and he's an author of several popular science books. He's one of the world's top experts on the genetics of snails, and has also studied the genetics and evolution of fruit flies and humans. He frequently lectures and broadcasts on various aspects of biology and other sciences, and his career has taken him far and wide to universities in the United States, Australia, and Africa. Let's welcome Steve for our last talk. Uh, thanks for that. Um, okay, I come in as, uh, the, as, a, as the bearer of a, an apparently almost extinct um, genetic, genetic signature, which is a Y chromosome, so it's appropriate that I should be last in the list. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about extinction in the human sense, about the, the way in which human differences across the world are um, very quickly eroding away. It's well known that uh, of the famous phrase, no man is an island, no woman is an island either. Nowadays, as we've heard in the last talk, no island is an island because everything is being homogenized. The, Gal the Galapagos, for example, many of their creatures are being driven to extinction by other creatures that come in from outside by migration. And what I want to talk about is a parallel, somewhat of a parallel of that, in human populations. Um, if you were to go to a textbook on human biology from the time of Darwin or a bit later, you would certainly get an, Im whoops, an image that looked a bit like this. And this is an image of the so-called races of humankind. And I, I don't, uh, racial types as they call them. And I'm not going to go into the question of whether there are real races of humankind because there aren't. But it's interesting to note that until quite recently, people assumed, uh, scientists assumed too, that the human species was divided into distinct groups that were biologically dif different from each other and had been isolated from each other for a long, long time. Well, to some extent, that was true. Until quite recently, human populations were isolated from each other. <clears throat> That's changing quite quickly. And I can illustrate that, perhaps, by a simple experiment. Um, can you uh, shake hands, if you don't mind? You'll have to. Can you shake hands with one of the two people next door to you? For about half of you, I have just, for about half of you, I have just introduced you to your sixth cousin. Okay. <laughs> and that's a surprising fact, but it is true. So what I'm saying is that for about half of you, um, you two of you shared an ancestor who lived at about the time when The Origin of Species was written in 1859 and when Darwin went to the Galapagos. So for a population like the modern British population or the modern European population, we are really, uh, it might seem, quite close, more closely related to each other on average than you might have imagined. But however, were I to be giving this talk in Pakistan, um, which I probably wouldn't go down particularly well, if I were to do the experiment again, for about half of the people shaking hands, they would be shaking hands with their first cousin. Okay, So they would be shaking hands with somebody who shared an ancestor with them who was alive during the Second World War. And what that tells us is that the European population is much more open in biological terms, much more admixed, as we would say, than our populations, say, in Pakistan, where people don't move very much, they tend to marry within groups, and uh, families stay closed within families. So that effect is really quite striking. Pakistan is much more inbred than Britain, uh, the w and the question is, what's going to happen in the future? Are we going to remain as these isolated groups, as some places still are, or are we going to become even more admixed? Now, you can put some figures on how inbred, how closely related, we are bound to be. Let me um, show you a picture of the end of the world. This is the apocalypse, according to William Blake, and as we all know, if we read the uh, book of Revelation, written, clearly written by a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, it's filled with terrifying things that are going to happen at the end of time. Everybody who has ever lived uh, will come up from the grave and will be, uh, will, uh, will stand ready for judgment on the plain of Armageddon. And they'll be decided whether they're good or evil. Good people, a very small proportion, will go to heaven. Everybody here at the uh, Serpentine Gallery is clearly a good person, so you're all safe. But if you were to go, for example, to the Freeze Art Fair, you would certainly burn in hell <laughs> for the first Ray Bill future. Now, that's an interesting story because, in fact, it has a, uh, a reflection from history. 
Here we have a picture of Armageddon itself. This is the Israeli city, northern Israel, uh, called Megiddo. It's now a tell, it's now an excavation. I've been there. And Megiddo was a thriving city in Israel, um, which was destroyed in 722 BC by King Sargon of the Assyrians, who came in like a wolf on the fold and destroyed the city, killed lots of people, and drove the rest into exile. And the people of Megiddo uh, generated a myth, quite a common one, actually, that someday in the future they would be reunited. The lost tribes of Israel will come together, Ar Megiddo, on the, Ar Megiddon, in Megiddo on the plain. And that's where this idea of Armageddon comes from. Well, this happened in 722 BC. So let's count how many people would be at the event if everybody who had lived uh, was to be there. Now we all know that we have two parents, each one of us, four grandparents, most of us, eight grand grand grandparents, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. If that were the case all the way back to 722 BC, how many people would be assembled ready for judgment? Well, here's the sum, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 28, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096. I used to do this when I was eight in the bath. I, I, little did I realize I'd spend my life doing it. Um, uh, you would have approximately 100 million million supposed ancestors, uh, which would be more than enough to cover the whole surface of the Earth, uh, two or three people thick. Okay? So what that tells us is we have to share ancestors. We have to be inbred because there's no room on the family tree. We are all related to each other to some degree. In fact, everybody in the world descends from somebody who lived approximately in 4000 BC, which interestingly enough is the biblical estimate of the time of the Garden of Eden, but that's another story. But however, the extent to which we share ancestry differs very greatly from place to place and is, sh and is, uh, and is, um, uh, is uh, changing very, very quickly, which means extinction for lots of, at the moment, separate groups. Now, how are we going to study this? One way we can study it, of course, is by looking at pedigrees. Now, as you've perhaps heard of the introduction, I've wasted my life by working at snail population genetics. genetics. I'm one of the um, world's top six experts on snail population genetics. Uh, uh, the other five tend to agree. There aren't many of us. Um, but I've also worked on fruit flies, and I've even lowered myself to work on humans. Now, there is a human equivalent of the humble fruit fly, which is, of course, the royal family. Royal families are wonderful for genetics because they are defined by pedigrees. So they keep an account of how many ancestors they have. And if you look at particular royal families, they're often very, very separate from each other because they marry within themselves. Perhaps the classic example is the royal family of Spain. If, let's take, for example, um, Alfonso XII, who was the king of Spain in the 19th century. Alfonso XII actually married Ina, who was Queen Victoria's granddaughter, um, and she, Ina, brought in the famous haemophilia gene to the family, but that's another story. Now, if we were to do the uh, rules for Alfonso XII um, and go back for seven generations, he should have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128 different ancestors, seven generations back. But if we look at the pedigree, it turns out that seven generations back, he had only eight ancestors. Um, that's because it was cousin marriage after cousin marriage after cousin marriage. And that was true for plenty of people. Um, it's, uh, n fortunately for us, less true for the royal family who lives just, over the, just that way down the road. They're actually rather outbred. But plenty of royal families are inbred. And if you look at their pedigrees in more detail, what you get is lots and lots of loops, people marrying their relatives. And that's still really very common. Now, another way you can look at patterns of isolation is to look at a particular attribute which is inherited and which is easy to study and is very cheap to study because all you need to study it is a phone book. And this is the surname, okay? And there's a whole area of genetics which he works on the biology of surnames, second names in the European system, passed from father to son and to, and to daughter, but daughters change or changed their names on marriage. Now, this was discovered by a chap who founded our own laboratory at University College London, Francis Galton, who was the Charles Darwin's cousin and the founder of that rather dubious science called eugenics. But Galton was a highly talented man. He was interested in many things. He was interested in human quality most of all. Um, he, he made, uh, as far as we know, the only beauty map of the British Isles ever made based on the little brass counting device he held in the palm of his hand and went from city to city counting the local females on a five-point scale from attractive to repulsive. Um, <laughs> The low point was in Aberdeen, 
And the high point, you'd be glad to learn, was in South Kensington, just here. So not much has, not much has changed. Now, that's an, eccentric thing to, that's an eccentric thing to have done. But he did more interesting things than that. He had the habit of going on walking holidays in the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. And uh, then very poor, very isolated mountain villages. And he went one year, and he settled down in a little village. And he discovered something very strange, which was that somebody, everybody in that village, prepare yourself for a terrible joke, everybody in that village had the same second name. They were all called Spaghetti. Okay? Climbed over the mountains to the next village, uh, settled into the inn, asked people what their names were. Everybody had the same name, but it was a different one, Pasta. Next village, Cannelloni, and so on. Now, this for a moment made him think that this was because it was advantageous to be called spaghetti in village one, Pasta in village two. The, but a moment's thought that showed that wasn't true. It turned on the fact that people within the village married somebody else from the village. And if you looked into the pedigree of the village, Ten generations ago, there was a family called Pasta, a family called Spaghetti, a family called Cannelloni. But each generation, now and again, a man had no sons, so his name disappeared. And in time, one name took over. And so what you can do is to look at isolation by asking how many surnames there are in a particular place in relation to the number of, uh, number of, um, of people. Okay? And by doing that, you're asking how many Y chromosomes there are in a particular place in the relation. Actually, I'll skip that. Now, now here's, a, here's a map of Britain, um, rather perverse in, because it's, it's altered in terms of, um, in terms of, the, of, um, of uh, population number. And the warmer the colours, the more surnames there are in relation to the number of people. And you can see London, which is nice and warm, okay, has lots and lots of surnames in relation to the number of people. West Wales, which is where I come from, uh, it's blue and cool. It's cool in many ways, but it's cool in the surname way, which means that there aren't many surnames in relation to the number of people. And the Northern Islands of Scotland are even cooler. There are very few surnames in relation to the number of people. In other words, people are staying within their own group. They're marrying within their own group. They're keeping a biological identity. Now, that's interesting in many ways. It means you can immediately tell yourself by looking at the New York phone book, say, that New York is a much more mixed and outbred population than, than is, say, Oslo. In fact, the number of, mean number of surnames, people per surname in the New York phone book is two and a half. In Oslo, it's 60 because, again, a much more isolated population. Now, that's important not just because um, of curiosity, it's important in health terms. And if you look at the patterns of outbreeding and inbreeding across the world, you can see that some populations remain strongly isolated and separate from others within the same area. The warmer the colour, the more inbreeding. And you can see, for example, in Pakistan, which I've talked about, the extent of cousin marriage is so high and the extent of uncle-daughter, uncle-niece marriage is so high, which is even closer, that people are very, very closely related to each other um, within particular populations. In Britain, it's much less. In North America, it's much less again. That has an effect on health. This is the patterns of mortality and morbidity of children in Bradford, actually, British Pakistanis, um, versus uh, the European population of Bradford. Um, and you can see there's about a doubling in the mortality and, mor and morbidity of children. So it's, uh, it's important from the point of view of, um, of, um, of, uh, of medicine. And people in, in Bradford are now more and more aware of this, and there are attempts to uh, reduce the amount of cousin marriage, which actually is not being particularly successful. It's also interesting from the point of view of evolution. We, what we can do, we know very well from fossils, that humans, that we're all Africans. We got out of Africa maybe 80,000 years ago and spread across the world, getting to the new world only about 20,000 years ago. And if you look across the world from our birthplace in Africa and ask how much variation is there within particular populations, it turns out that these are the, the red lines of the tracks which we walked across the world, roughly speaking. If you measure the distance from Addis Ababa, walking distance, um, you get this amazing fit between the amount of genetic variation in a particular population and the distance from our birthplace. And that's because as we moved, we were inevitably in small inbred groups. So if you go into Europe, let's say, quite close to Africa, we're not, we're not particularly invariant. If we go to Eastern Asia, less variable again. If we go to Oceania, places like uh, Tahiti or southern tip of South America, we've lost about a third 
of our genetic variation. And that tells us over history, we've been rare animals. And the further we've moved away from our homeland, the more um, reduced we've become, and the more different these populations are, for purely random reasons, from their native, uh, from, their, from their ancestors. So the question then arises, what of the future? Well, in fact, we're in a moment in which we've reversed the processes which have driven human evolution since it began. First of all, there's very little natural selection anymore, but that's a different story. But second, and more important, we're no longer, by, in most places, get it doing this business of marrying people which are related to. Uh, we can see that in many ways. In London, which is a very outbred city, among children, young children under 10 in London, who've got one Afro-Caribbean parent, mother or father, the other parent, father or mother, is white, European. Okay? So really that barrier based on the genetics of skin color is breaking down very, very quickly. Interestingly enough, skin, uh, what determines who you will marry in London is not your skin color, oh, but overwhelmingly it's your educational level. Uh, education level, whether you've both got degrees or one's got a degree and one left school at 16, education level is five times more important in choosing a mate in London than is skin color. So those barriers are breaking down. Now we can see uh, in, different, in other ways how that's happening. What we can do, we can ask a simple question, and I'll ask you to ask yourselves this question. How far apart was the birthplace of yourself and your partner, if you have one, compared to the birthplace of your mother and father, your mother's mother and your uh, your mother's father, and so on. I can guarantee for almost everybody that that figure has enormously increased in just two or three generations. Uh, mine's a bit extreme. My wife actually was born in New York, um, 3,000 miles away. Uh, my parents were born in West Wales in two villages three miles apart, and I once gave this in a lecture, and a student at the back shouted, and it shows. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't. So, uh, so the, the, the marriage distance can tell you something, too. Um, the surnames, uh, the, the reason is, of course, that people are beginning to move. You no longer have to marry the boy or the girl next door. You can get on your, on your 747 and marry the boy or the girl from the other side of the world. In some ways, the, perhaps the most important um, event in human evolution was the invention of the bicycle, or indeed the 747, which is bringing the peoples of the world together and getting rid of these patterns of small, isolated groups. And I'll just end up by uh, showing another clue which shows how powerful, important, and advantageous this effect is. This is a map of the surname, my name, Jones, in 1881. You had to get to be, make 1% of the population to get onto this map. And you can see we were, we were, uh, we were tucked away behind Offa's Dyke in Wales. OK, here's the figure of Jones in 1998, and the Joneses are on the move. Um, we haven't, we've got to Oxford, we haven't got to Cambridge yet. Um, OK, uh, and that's true of everybody. There's an enormous movement and admixture of names and of genes. So in fact, what's happening to our species um, is that actually there is extinction. But I look, at, I look to that, unlike the extinction in the animal world, as being a very positive effect and not a very negative one, and I do hope you agree with me.